Hi, I'm Osha Ginsberg. The young woman you're about to meet first came to prominence writing hilarious recaps of a reality television show I host called The Bachelor. Her writing captured the public's imagination and made glorious fun of my hair. Rosie Waterland is a writer, performer and comedian. Like myself, she's been public around her struggles with anxiety and mental health. But no matter the pain, Rosie has always found a way to turn her dark stories into comedy gold. What do your sisters think of this award? Rhiannon's like, I can't believe you and mum, all you've done is like just talk about our bogan life and like <laughs> you've been nominated for this award and like millions of people have listened to it now. The podcast I created with my mum was nominated for an Australian Commercial Radio Award. Well, yeah, but they're also just like, we can't believe you're going to that. Like, you're such a goober. Like, <laughs> it was very fancy, very exciting, and had an awards ceremony that I very much did not want to attend because I was terrified. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nuts. Oh, doesn't that make me sound like a bit of a dickhead? Oh, it's so hard doing red carpet events. <laughs> problem to have, but it, uh, it is just, uh, I'm not great at them. I'm too awkward. I'm too awkward. <laughs> Rosie doesn't have a filter. Got my anti-chafing shorts on. Yeah. <laughs> she puts it all out in the open. She refuses to feel shame and embarrassment. The only thing that doesn't get covered is all the stretch marks on my stomach, but too bad, world. Yeah. Fat girls can wear crop tops too. And it means that she is relatable and vulnerable and funny, but she has no on-off switch. <laughs> Writing things down, and particularly my own story, became the shovel that I used to dig myself out of a very shitty childhood. I've always, my entire life, used laughter and jokes and humour and comedy as a way to kind of deal with that stuff. I always knew I would write my story one day. Every time my dad passed out drunk or my mum didn't come home, I was like, keep it up because <laughs> I'm remembering all of this. <laughs> And this is going to be in a book one day, so keep it up. I have had a television in my room since I was four years old. And it's been my best friend, my third parent, my everything. One of the most important relationships in my life. Good to see you too, Angus. Television showed me what life could be like, but it also showed me potential for what I wanted to do. Like I knew from a very young age, I want to be involved in that. I want to write that. Now, as you all know, Maddie has already said goodbye to Charlene. I first came across her when she was writing these Bachelor recaps for Mamma Mia. I know that sounds terrible, but they were hilarious. Someone sent me the link and went, you've got to read this. And I just laughed so hard from the first word to the last. It was just such perfectly written satire, which poked fun, yet at the same time appreciated everything that was wonderful <laughs> about our show. With some of the women, the connections just, they're not going to happen. Rosie Waterland, I think, is the best television writer the world has produced since Clive James. Tara, will you accept this rose? Yes, thank you. I'm not surprised that television was the thing that broke me out of what had turned into a pretty miserable life. <laughs> TV, man, always has my back. <laughs> always has my back. Would you please welcome Rosie Waterland! <laughs> Rosie! 
My mum was an alcoholic with bipolar disorder. My dad was an alcoholic with schizophrenia. Both of them also dabbled in drug use and experimented just a little with abandoning their children. <laughs> My mum and my dad, they were both the kind of problematic kids of their families. They both started drinking pretty early on. And it was just a kind of perfect recipe for chaos. And because they were super responsible adults, they decided to have kids. I was born in a little town called Tumut, which is where my parents were hiding because they were on the run from some drug dealers that they'd ripped off. <laughs> we got over the drug use, but Tony was continuing to drink very, very heavily, and there was a fair bit of domestic violence. It was intolerable, and there was just no way out, and I had no money, you know, so... It was just pretty awful, especially with having two little girls. I don't remember Dad ever not drunk. He was loving, but you were always kind of um, on edge with, you know, what, what was going to happen. I never felt safe with him, ever. I was anxious all the time. I used to throw up a lot when I was a kid from anxiety because of him. A bunch of kids started running up the hill from the park towards us and they were screaming, there's a dead guy, there's a dead guy. Rhiannon and I looked at each other we looked down at this man in the dirt and we both knew that's, that's him, that's our dad. All of a sudden, my dad moaned. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> Nothing will terrify <laughs> a bunch of kids more <laughs> than telling them they are standing in front of a dead body <laughs> only to have that dead body make a sound. <laughs> I was eight when he died. I was so relieved that I would never have to be around him and I wouldn't feel sick. And I didn't cry. I was desperately heartbroken. I didn't know what to do with the feelings I had. And the only way I could do it was by drinking. I'd go overnight and leave the girls there if I couldn't get the babysitter from across the road. So they were left in the house by themselves while I went off drinking and partying, which I feel really badly about. I could not give you a number of the amount of houses we lived in. And then it's mixed in with a lot of different rehab centres, a lot of different halfway houses. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I went to at least 20 schools. This is the first house I can really remember living in. Like, I have such vivid memories of this house. It was just housing commission houses in one estate. We just finally felt like we were around people who understood what our lives were like. There was a lot of alcohol abuse and drug use and a lot of problems in that area. And when we were in trouble, Mum used to lock the screen door and we would sit right at the bottom of the stairs there and we wouldn't be allowed out. There was this sense of everybody looking out for each other all the time. And it wasn't until we left that neighbourhood and went to live in a regular private neighbourhood that um, people called docs on us. Lisa then went on to have two more daughters, Taylor and Bella, and they both have different fathers. My mum 
jumping from guy to guy, ends up with four daughters that she can't really look after. And so the four of us ended up in and out of foster homes and the doc system and living with family members. There was so much in here, don't you reckon, that mum didn't tell us? Why did we go to foster care? Mm. My sisters and I decided to apply for our doc's files. Like, it's so weird how you don't remember the time frame of anything. Going through them was quite hard just to read some, you know, things. But there was some stuff in here that made me sad. When Mum would take off for days, I would just go to school and Rhiannon would stay home and take care of the baby. And, you know, we got away with that for a long time. Because we didn't know, like... We tried as hard as we could to keep it a secret, Rhiannon and I. We really did. Getting an insight into... But then we read the docs files when we got older and sometimes Mum was the one who called docs and told them she didn't want us. More than a few times. Yeah, like, and she said, we're too much. We're too much, I can't handle it. Keep them where they are. So it wouldn't have mattered how hard my sister and I tried to hide the fact we were home alone. She told them, which we didn't know. I want to escape from everything, to tell you the truth. Myself, my grief. I just didn't want the responsibility. I wasn't there for them and I and I neglected, you know, large parts of my responsibility as a mother. But on, on the other hand, I was a really good mother when I was there. The four of us were separated permanently when I was 14. It was an awful night where she got very drunk and she called docs and told them we were uncontrollable children and they had to come and take us away. I think Taylor was about six. Just to have to tell her, you know, that she was now having to leave and go with, um, yeah, docs to go and live with a foster family. Like, it was just so horrible. Rhiannon was um, 17, so she was kind of able to look after herself. My little sister Bella went to live with her dad on the Central Coast. And then Rosie went to live with my uncle Mark. My uncle took me and uh, he sent me to boarding school. <laughs> to me, it was like going to this school was like finally my payoff. Like, I've had this awful childhood, and but now, because I'm smart, this is my prize. I went from a school that, like, didn't have enough chairs in rooms for all the students to a school that had an aquatic centre and a TV studio. <laughs> she suddenly had these amazing educational opportunities. She had teachers who saw how brilliantly clever she was and were able to invest in her and really help her to flourish academically. I loved drama and the drama facilities were just out of this world and I did really well in my HSC thanks to that school, but I was bullied horrendously. They could smell a Hauser kid from a mile away and um, it just ended up being a nightmare. It was awful. <laughs> I first met Rosie when we started at the Australian Academy of Dramatic Art. Antonio started drama school with us at the same time and just like Rosie, he was a show pony who loved nothing more than to make people laugh and was just as willing to be the butt of the joke. I think when drama school finished, that's when the cracks really started to show. For a long time in my early 20s, I did not understand what the hell was wrong with me. I did not understand why I'd be fine at work selling jeans and then two minutes later, I would be shaking and uh, struggling to breathe and feeling terrified. Post-traumatic stress disorder from my childhood set in quite significantly. I was kind of stuck in this rut. 
and Tony was the one who convinced me I should start submitting things to get published. I was very lucky to be plucked out of nowhere by Jamila Rizvi, who at the time was the editor of uh, Mamma Mia. We had a submissions inbox and I used to comb through hundreds and hundreds of pieces of writing a week and Rosie's writing stood out. Mia and Jamila just saw that I had some kind of innate talent for writing and just helped me nurture it. Excuse me, are you on TV? Um, oh, I've, I sort of did some stuff with The Bachelor. <gasps> did you get a rise? No, I wasn't on the show. While I was there, I started writing recaps of The Bachelor, <laughs> and which I just thought was silly and, and, and nobody really thought it was going to work. They were fantastic, and she was getting enormous numbers of hits because she had hit the tone spot on about why people were enjoying this show, and she was describing it in this really fresh, vigorous, hilarious way. Other things popped up and there was interest in offering me a book deal. Let's talk books. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> I'm up for it. She wrote a memoir called The Anti-Cool Girl, which was a coming of age story in some ways and a getting of wisdom story. After just living this entire life where I was in control of nothing, there was a lot of power in feeling like I could have control of my narrative. She takes us into a world that most of us have never experienced. The world of, of housing commission and heroin and alcoholism and parents attempting to commit suicide in front of their children. It is spectacularly useful, I think, to other people to show that all these things are to some extent survivable. There's no victim bragging here. With Rosie, the darker the subject, the funnier she is. I stood silently at the window and watched as mum positioned the chair under the tree. My mind was grappling with the complexities of a decision I should not have been attempting to make while wearing Hello Kitty pajamas. She couldn't I'm incredibly her proud of her book. So she just ended up rocking her whole body from side to side. It was quite emotional. to get the bloody thing to move. Because a fair bit of the content really upset me. Because I was seeing it from her point of view not so much from mine. And a lot of it I'd tried to, to sort of cover up so I'd feel a bit better about it, I think. Oh, my gosh, it's beloved writer and comedian Rosie Waterland, everybody. Wow. After the publication of her first memoir, she felt she had made it. It was a best-selling memoir. She was being invited on to talk to radio. Yeah, my sisters and I had quite a rough time. There was a comedy tour. She's a performer, she's appearing on panel shows. Rosie, what did you make of uh, Pauline Hanson's tears? Maybe politics just isn't her jam. Maybe it's just time to change direction, go to TAFE, learn a trade, I don't know. <laughs> I remember just thinking, what a glorious Cinderella story. Hey, we're backstage at the Opera House and we're filming a secret video. Tony went with her on her first stand-up comedy tour to every single event. Uh, he travelled on the road with her because she was too scared to perform otherwise. My two favourite bees chilling together. And I was feeling on top of the world and I kind of just thought, well, everything will be fine now forever. And then suddenly the world comes along and takes away the most important person in it. It was a total fluke shock accident. Tony was swimming laps and he was on his own and he had a seizure and he drowned. <sighs> Tony was brave for me when I didn't know how to be and Tony kind of filled that void that I think maybe I wouldn't know because I never had good parents, but filled that void that I think maybe good parents do in that he, he built this kind of emotional scaffolding for me to be ready to face the world. 
I had a nervous breakdown and that was very unexpected because I've gotten so good at managing my symptoms. Rosie called around two or three in the morning. She sounded happy and drunk. About halfway through the conversation, she said, oh, Jam, I've done something really stupid. I've done something so stupid. And she said, oh, I've, I've swallowed all these pills. We thought Rosie had been riding high when really she, she was lying to all of us, lying to us to protect us and because I think she felt she had to live up to the narrative of her book, which was this story of grand success over trauma. Childhood trauma, the effects of that do not go away, that it, it, it's always with you. And um, it has been over the last five years at particular high points in my career that, you know, I've come to the very rude awakening that my mental health can still creep up on me and take me by surprise when I least expect it. It ended up being quite funny to me that I was writing a book already called Every Lie I've Ever Told and I actually ended up realising that I was telling the biggest lie of all, which is that I was OK. I take medication, I see a psychiatrist. I've learned to understand my body and to understand my triggers and to understand when I need to step back and when I need to take time for myself. My sisters are the best at helping me through this stuff. They are the ones who are always there whenever I've had any significant problems with my mental health. I always did keep in contact with Rosie, also with Taylor. But it was Bella that I didn't see for years. I feel lucky that Dad had taken custody of me and taken me away, but I don't think I feel lucky that you know, they had the bad end of the stick and I had the good end. It actually upsets me quite a bit. <laughs> now she comes down all the time and she's part of all our family stuff that we do. And as soon as she was able, we wanted her back. We've fought really hard to keep our little sister group together because it's all we really have. It's like the only real thing that's been stable, I think, in all of our lives, have been each other. I really do think Taylor probably had it worse than any of us. Taylor was bounced around to a bunch of foster homes before she landed in her permanent one. She was certainly, um, I think, neglected. She was extremely lonely. If you look at the four of the sisters individually, you can definitely see that each of us are hurt. Hi! Hello! And each of us are struggling and each of us are bearing some sort of cross throughout this, like, life. What about work? It's just really busy. I'm incredibly proud of my sister Rhiannon because she was a single mum at like 17, 18 and she is in her third year now of university to do nursing. Guess what? Rhiannon's a really good mum. I called Taylor Sarah. That's really important to me to break that cycle with my kids. I don't want them to have what, or to go through what I went through. We know that by sticking together, we can stop the cycle of trauma now with us. <laughs> Rhiannon doesn't drink now. Taylor doesn't drink now. <laughs> I don't drink a lot. But the main thing was we didn't understand what drinking in moderation was, because we'd never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, my mum got incredibly sick and she developed cirrhosis of the liver. 
I'd have all the girls around me and I'd see them laughing and having a conversation. But I didn't, it just went straight over my head. I could no longer participate in life. And that's what my life had become. She ended up being put into hospital and I think they just told her, you know, if you keep drinking, then you're going to die. Miraculously, I stopped drinking. I didn't think it was possible at all. I mean, what would I do without alcohol? I'd used it for a crutch since I was 14 years old. Two and a half years I've been sober now. My family are just so important to me. No, it's not to be saving. Sally, we have our, um, our disagreements. But, I mean, that's what I live for, basically, is my family, my grandchildren, my beautiful girls. My mum and my sister did a podcast called My Mum Said My Memoirs A Lie. And it was just about mum calling out Rosie on all the stories, saying that they weren't true. Hey, can you play back the chapter where she was chasing us with a knife and then we talked? Lisa disputed pretty much everything in that book. And Rosie being Rosie thought, well, we should do a podcast about that. That night with the butcher's knife, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. In fact, in my mind now, <laughs> I don't know, it's humorous. We talked about things that we hadn't for a long time, so we hadn't ever actually discussed. I was mucking around. No, you weren't, yes, Mum. Was. No. So because we were able to put it on the table, it was much better. Do you, like, feel bad? Yeah, I feel bad because you feel bad. That it scared us. Of course I do. I thought I was just giving her a chance to tell her side of the story and that I was very emotionally evolved and being so generous. There's things that you remember that didn't even happen. That's not true. But I found recording that podcast extremely difficult. Having to sit across from someone who put you through hell, basically, and have to listen to her, you know, explain a lot of it away or deny a lot of it. I was so drunk and out of control that I didn't think of that. But you can't just pass the blame like I'm that. I'm not. I can feel as sorry as I bloody want, but I can't change it. And somehow I have to accept that and accept the difficulties I've caused my daughters from my drinking. I feel desperately sorry that my lifestyle affected my, my children so much. Rosie's podcast was nominated for a commercial radio award. I felt like I was in a room with a thousand people who all went to the same high school and I was the only one who didn't. <laughs> so I felt really random. Our next award is for Best Original Podcast. The winner is, this is great, Rosie Waterland oh. from Mum Says My Memoirs Alive. Oh, my goodness. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie is crazy brave. She is not going to let all this stuff define her, and she's going to be the person she wants to be. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Holy crap. I would be happy to not write another word about myself ever again. <laughs> I am so done <laughs> mining my trauma for my creative work. <laughs> I just want to write fart jokes now. I just want to write fiction. I just want to write about people who aren't me. I just didn't want to fall over. And oh my God, thank God I didn't fall over. I just want to laugh every day. I just want to write about characters that laugh every day. That's all I want. Laughter all the time. No more trauma. Laughter. Laughter.